Before we begin, I wanted to give a trigger warning. There are mentions of suicide in this episode. Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to be learning about the 2018 movie At Eternity's Gate. That movie is all about Vincent Van Gogh, and today I'm ecstatic to be joined by the Pulitzer Prize winning author Stephen Nafee. He has a brand new book called Van Gogh and the Artists He Loved. Before we connect with Stephen, though, it's time to set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, Paul Gauguin was interested in Vincent van Gogh because of his art dealer brother. Number two, John Rewald said the villagers in Auvergne told him Van Gogh was killed by two bullies. Number three, Vincent's brother Theo went on to sell Vincent's artwork for years after his brother's death. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and by a simple process of elimination, you'll be able to find out which one is a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to chat with Stephen Nafee about the historical accuracy of At Eternity's Gate. We'll talk about some of the details in the movie in a little bit, but before we do that, from an overall perspective, how well do you think the movie did capturing the essence of Vincent van Gogh's life? Well, that's a difficult question. (laughs) Let me see if I can answer it directly. It was okay from a sort of representational verisimilitude perspective, but I'm not sure that's what it was aiming for. My thinking is that most biopics can only come so close to the reality of of a person's life. In fact, even a book which allows a whole lot more detail and more intimacy than a film does can only achieve uh, accuracy in terms of portraying the person's life to a certain extent. But in a film, it's even more difficult, I think. But you you know more about this than I do because you focus on it. And I'm not sure that this movie really even tried to represent Vincent um, accurately from either from a psychological or, or a biographical standpoint. So I'm not sure that it would be fair to Julian Schnabel, who made the film, to criticize it for not doing those things. But I'm happy to answer the question, does it? I sort of wanted to set that up so that any comments I make don't sound like they're criticism of him. They're just an answer to your question, how, how realistic is it? My overall feeling is the movie is really about Schnabel and not about Van Gogh. Meaning that he what he's trying to convey is the heightened awareness of the visual, he being Schnabel, is the heightened awareness of the visual world, of the natural world, on the part of an artist. So an enormous amount of time in the film is given over to Vincent walking through nature, literally just walking and walking and walking and looking and experiencing. And my feeling watching, and I watched it twice now, once for this recording, is that I think Schnabel was really trying to convey to the reader his way of seeing the natural world and the beauty of it and the intensity of it, rather than specifically trying to convey Van Gogh's perception of the natural world. Does that does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So early on in the movie, we are introduced to Paul Gauguin, and the impression that I saw from this meeting was Vincent looked up to him, but it doesn't really explain why. Can you give a little more historical context around who he was and if he looked up to him? First of all, it's I'm not sure he met him at that point. We're not quite sure when they met. So it's a reasonable screen device to have Vincent meet him there in advance of, of Gauguin going to live with him in, uh, in Arles. Gauguin was a little bit more professionally 
accomplished than Van Gogh was at that moment. He has sold a little bit. Uh, he had a circle of, of admirers, Gauguin did, especially in pont on the, on the coast. You know, he'd been to Martinique and a, a, an artist had gone with him to Martinique. So there's reason to believe that Vincent would have looked up to him to a certain extent because he thought of him as slightly more uh, successful and more a part of the artistic community than Vincent himself was. But the, the differences were not extreme, meaning Gauguin was not tremendously successful at that point. Vincent's brother, Theo, was an art dealer. And Go- Gauguin was interested in, in Vincent, as were the other artists, to the extent that they were interested in him, because he was a conduit to Theo. The, there, there were very few art dealers in Paris at the time who were showing the work of the most recent avant-garde. In fact, even the Impressionists had, had very few dealers who were interested in them. And um, while Vincent was in Arles, about the time that Gauguin went to live with him, Theo had what has become a famous show of Monet and Rodin. That gives you a sense of, of how significant Theo was in their world. So it, what Vincent really felt towards Gauguin was the opportunity for making a social connection. In addition to feeling unsuccessful professionally, even more intensely than that, Vincent felt terribly lonely. He had no friends. His psychological problems, which were significant, prevented him from making genuine, easy connections with other people. It helped, as I just said, in Paris for the two years that he was there, that getting to know Vincent was a way of getting to know Theo. So he was able to make some connections, but they weren't really good friendships. Early on, he decided that Gauguin was what, when Vincent then leaves Paris after two years and goes to Arles in the south of France, he's instantly even lonelier because at least in Paris, he had his brother and he had a few connections uh, sponsored by his brother. He gets to Arles and he's essentially all alone. And uh, he desperately wanted to create what was later known as the Yellow House. In fact, he himself called it the Yellow House. And he wanted to invite not just one artist, but many artists to come and live and work together there as a kind of monastic community of artists. And there were numerous people that he tried to entice to join this fraternity. But high on the list was Gauguin. Gauguin showed some interest because he wasn't selling well enough. And Theo offered him a stipend if he was willing to go down and live with Vincent. So there was a kind of um, a professional background to their to their involvement. It wasn't so much a, a friendship. The moment in the film where they two meet, the, the two of them meet, having spent 10 years writing the biography of Van Gogh, the life, and thinking about him and reading his letters, you develop a pretty a mental image of the person you're writing about and the most important people in in that person's uh, immediate circle. And uh, my mental image of Van Gogh, especially when he's interacting with other people, is much more intense than is conveyed in the film. Uh, intense to the point of that it was uncomfortable to be around him. And people talked about the fact that his uh, combination, he had because of his what was likely temporal lobe epilepsy, he had a, a very unfortunate combination of argumentativeness. I mean, he could not have a sustained conversation without immediately arguing with the person he's talking with. And viscosity. Viscosity means wanting to get too close to the person you're talking to, meaning wanting to almost adhere to that person in ways that are not, that are beyond the normal. Like physically too close or like emotionally? Emotionally too close. Like wanting to sort of envelop that person in your life immediately not from a sexual or romantic standpoint, but just from an intensity of social interaction. And you can imagine the combination of this person wanting to get too close to you and wanting to argue with you all the time is among the reasons why he had a very difficult time making any friends, uh, including and sustaining the relationship with Theo even. It was impossible for Theo to live with him there in Paris. And, and by the same token, Gauguin comes across as a kind of sort of smug, arrogant, uh, suave, but slightly creepy guy. <laughs> you know, he, he he prided himself on not only his way with women, which was real, but, you know, having fostered a lot of illegitimate children and uh, making all this more amusement. This is the I mean, amusing is that Gauguin was very short. So he was this sort of very short Lothario 
who dressed in weird ways. He sort of dressed with out, in slightly outlandish ways. And there was, a, a, as I said, a kind of smugness to him. In the meeting, in the movie, you don't get any sense of that. Gauguin seems perfectly sort of normal, whatever that means. And Van Gogh seems more normal than he really was. I mean, I think the, the confrontation would have been more intense. And we don't really know that they actually met in person until Gauguin shows up in Arles. And we know that the, almost from the second they met in Arles, Gauguin was plotting to leave. I mean, he could not handle being with Vincent. He immediately was writing his friends in Paris saying, I, I got to get out of here. So that gives you a sense of the relationship between the two of them, which is not insignificant because it was the, other than Theo, the only person that Van Gogh lived with in the last few years of his life. Well, you mentioned Theo, and I wanted to ask you about something that the movie shows about him. It shows that when Vincent leaves Paris and goes to the yellow house that you mentioned as well, that Theo is sending 250 francs a month to pay for his expenses. Did Theo actually pay for Vincent's expenses? Yes, he did. Although, as, as I recall, the number was 150 francs. I mean, those are the kind of differences. Who cares? You know, but he was not only paying Vincent 150, but he was paying Gauguin 150 while Gauguin was there, which was one of the reasons why Gauguin thought this was a reasonable thing. All of this money was supposedly against sales. I mean, it was supposedly it was an advance from Theo, but Theo had been paying this 150 francs for a very long time. I mean, for, for years and years, in addition to sending him materials. And uh, Van Gogh never sold anything. I mean, he sold one painting that we know of during that entire period, whereas Gauguin started, uh, the minute he moved to Arles, Theo sold a major painting of his and then began to sell not uh, an enormous number, but sell, he began to sell regularly. So the, the financial transaction with Gauguin was successful. The financial transaction with his brother Vincent was just a way of supporting him because there was no sense that he was going to be able to sell any of Vincent's work. I also want to ask you some, uh, something that you had touched on, because throughout the movie, we do see Vincent walking in nature a lot. You know, he's carrying his supplies around. He doesn't really seem to be trying to find a job. He, I think at one point he talks about uh, like a menacing spirit threatening him and going out in nature and painting helps him calm down. So my interpretation was that Van Gogh's motivations for painting was not about the money, but rather to kind of calm his inner demons. Is that a fair assessment of his motivations? I think that it did calm him down. But in terms of motivation, he saw himself as a professional artist. So I think it would be problematic to suggest that he was not doing this essentially for the standard reasons that a professional artist wants to do it, uh, which is first and foremost to make things that can be sold. And as you can see, since he only sold one painting, it was not just frustrating, but incredibly humbling and humiliating even. And one of the problems with Gauguin was that the fact that Gauguin was selling and that Theo, of all people, was selling Gauguin's work. And Theo, who could be a little bit unkind, was selling, was sending Gauguin letters saying, oh, everybody in Paris loves your work. (laughs) I'm, I'm... I'm getting, in addition to the sales I've already made, I've got lots of people who are interested. And there's poor Vincent with nothing like that from his own brother, Theo. So I I, I do think that when he was painting, especially, it did calm him down. In fact, there was a, uh, it was a Dutch Protestant thing that work made you help alleviate the anxieties and the, and the terrors of life and his own mother admonished her kids. There were, there were six kids in uh, the family. And her, one of her principal lessons to all of her children was that, you know, work hard. Work hard will, will get you through the day. <laughs> hard work will. I think it, it is certainly true that Vincent, who was very unhappy and very lonely and, and, and also psychologically troubled, was least troubled when he was intensely engaged in the act of painting. That was something that came through as I was watching the movie, that that, the act of painting helped him mentally. I think the movie caught that very well. 
there was a couple of moments that were very nice when he arrives in not in the yellow house but in the place he first lived in Arl, and he takes his shoes off and puts them on the floor and arranges them a little bit and then makes a painting of them i thought uh, schnabel really caught that very nicely the painting wasn't didn't look much like vincent's which is neither here nor there but the act of seeing the shoes and imagining the painting and, and it was also very beautifully filmed, as is most of the film. So I think Schnabel caught that particularly well. There's a scene in the movie where Vincent starts naming off some of the painters that he likes. Uh, there's Franz Hals, Goya, Velazquez, uh, Veronese, and Delacroix are the ones that are mentioned specifically in the movie. Was the movie correct to suggest that Van Gogh's style was inspired by those other painters? Yes, and in fact, um, but I've just written a book uh, about Van Gogh, and and the artist who inspired him, straightforwardly called Van Gogh and the artist he loved. And virtually all artists are inspired by other artists. I mean, it's really hard not to be. But Van Gogh, well, first of all, he, he, he had a wonderful way. One of the many things about him that's so lovely and so ennobling is that he, he once told Theo, people should love more artists more. He wasn't cranky about his selection of artists. He liked artists of, of many different styles of many different uh, ability uh, abilities. And added to that, he had a, a near photographic memory. So that in an era when, you know, especially unless you lived in a big city, as he did quite often in his life, but in the last two years of his life, when he did most of the paintings that we, we know best, most of those masterpieces pieces were painted in the last two years of his life. And in those two years, he had no access to museums. We live in such a visual world where we not only have color, you know, art books, but we have on our phones the entire history of art. Sitting there on our phone at any time in color. You know, Vincent didn't have that. Despite that, every time he went to a museum, he just drank in the paintings he liked, and he could remember them in minute detail later. And because he loved so much, so many artists for so many reasons, that process was constantly informing his art. And I think is one of the things that you know, because he had psychological problems, and because he was, um, he, he had all kinds of psychological problems. Probably the epilepsy being the dominant one, but he was manic depressive, and he was drinking something called the absinthe, which had a psychotic which was a drug and not just an, uh, a form of alcohol. And uh, he drank too much. He was, uh, and, and, uh, and, and his childhood had been terrible. Uh, there was all kinds of PTSD throughout his life. We have this image of him as being crazy, which in some ways he was. I mean, the family almost committed him to an insane asylum until he fought it and made it impossible. At the same time, he was an incredibly thoughtful, alert, coherent, painter who fully understood the culture out of which he came and the uh, art forms out of which he came. He did have psychotic episodes, but he never painted during those episodes. He's sort of like Jackson Pollock, the other artist that Greg Smith and I wrote about, who was a terrible alcoholic, but he didn't paint when he was drunk. And in Vincent's case, he didn't paint when he was in a psychotic episode. And he did, when he was painting, have the benefit of his knowledge of all the art that came before him. So that, for example, we think of him as a revolutionary artist, which he was. He took things, he sort of took things further than other artists had, but the other artists had been moving in that same direction before he got there. For example, he loved what is called the uh, law of simultaneous contrast, which is where you get an intensity of color by contrasting opposites on the color wheel, red and green, blue and yellow, um, that comes out of Delacroix. I mean, Del it, it comes out of color theorists, but Delacroix made it one of the sort of principal forces in his painting. This br the brushwork, this thick brushwork that we know him, we, we see in Van Gogh's paintings. Uh, there was an artist named Monticelli, whom Vincent and Theo were very uh, admired enormously and bought several of Monticelli's paintings. And Monticelli, decades earlier, painted with incredibly thick paint. Some of the sort of recent styles in Paris, a pointillism, uh, what George Seurat was known for, uh, these of cre uh, recreating the visual world with tiny little dots of pure color. 
rather than mixing them together so that the eye takes them in and resolves them in the mind. It's a way of creating a sense of, of light that Surat and the other finalists were, a luminosity that Surat and the other artists, uh, finalists were trying to create. Van Gogh, you know, he not only painted finalist paintings while he was in, uh, in Paris, but there were finalist details even in the paintings that he did thereafter. He also was a great lover of prints and especially black and white engravings uh, from that uh, that he knew in England and he collected thereafter. And a lot of this brushwork with sort of directional brush strokes come directly out of those prints. That's a, that's a long way of saying that he was very much aware of the artist who came before him and, and all that awareness significantly influenced and enriched the art that he made himself. If we go back to the movie, after Gauguin leaves, he's uh, returning to Paris. The movie shows that uh, Vincent admits that the two had some fights, but he's not really sure if he hurt Paul at all. But then he says he took a razor, cut off his ear, and then gives it to a girl at the bar, assuming that she's going to then give it to Gauguin as a way of uh, apologizing to him. Of course, she gets this bloody ear and calls the police. How well did the movie do showing how Vincent's ear was cut off? Well, I thought it was an interesting choice on Schnabel's part not to actually film the incident itself. And I don't know that that was, uh, I can't imagine it was done for, for financial reasons. I mean, it would have been more expensive to film that. So I think he just it was, a, I think my guess, purely a guess, is that he was afraid that it would overwhelm the film if you, if you left the film and the dominant image in your mind was this incredibly bloody, terrible incident. Uh, that's my guess. Is he didn't want that to overwhelm the sort of poetic message he was creating. But in terms of what happened with the year, I think it's dead on. I think Schnabel got that exactly right. And what's important there is that the literature is not absolutely consistent on what happened at that point, because there were, there were people, art historians especially, but historians who wanted to believe that he gave it to the prostitute as a romantic, sort of crazed romantic gesture. And in fact, the prostitute he gave it to was not the girl that he saw in that brothel. It was the girl that Gauguin saw in that brothel. So it was to, to give, he did go there to give the ear to, uh, the severed ear to this girl to give to uh, Gauguin. And, 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 and Greg Smith and I definitely believe that it was, uh, that, uh, it, th this incident was about Gauguin and not about some girl in the problem. It happened at Christmas. Christmas was a, was always a difficult time for Vincent because it, he was yet again away from his family, and Christmas was absolutely the central event in the in the year of his father, who was a pastor. He was a preacher, and Christmas was extremely important, and it was the symbol of family. And all of a sudden, he was he wasn't welcome in the family home, so he was already. Christmas was already a troublesome time for him. And then that Christmas with Gauguin threatening to leave, it was, was terrifying to him that, all, that yet again he was going to be all alone. And uh, we think that, th that some combination of those problems triggered one of his psychotic episodes. He may not have painted during a psychotic episode, but he did cut off his ear. Pretty, uh, it, 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 we, we, we weren't there, but it's pretty clear he was in the middle of a psychotic episode when he did it. And it was triggered in part by Gauguin's departure. That, that almost answers the next question that I had, because the next question I have for you actually is from my best friend. She's passionate about art history. So she's told me about some of the controversies surrounding these fights between Van Gogh and Gauguin that are really only briefly mentioned in the movie. And one of those being the possibility that Gauguin was the one who cut off Van Gogh's ear and Van Gogh was then covering for him. What do we know about the circumstances around how Gauguin left Van Gogh and the possibility that he might have been the one that cut off Van Gogh's ear? One of the problems with Van Gogh is that there is no other artist who attracts the amount of attention that Van Gogh does. I don't think that's a, uh, even a marginally uh, outrageous statement. I mean, we don't have millions and millions and millions of people are going to these immersive experiences all over the place. You know, they're, they're, these are so popular, there are sometimes two of them in a single city. And there are people spending, you know, 40, 50, $100 to go participate in Van Gogh's world for a, a short period of time. Uh, so anything that happens to Vincent is front page news, practically. Uh, 
So we knew this because Greg and I decided that we don't need to go into that here, although it's actually relevant to this. If you want to later, we'll go into it. Our deep analysis of the research materials indicated that Van Gogh did not shoot himself, that he was shot by two bullies. And that was world news. I mean, there were like 150,000 articles of one kind or another when that happened. So a lot of other people have said some newsmaking things about Vincent's life that may or may not be accurate. Let me give you an example that you're sort of pointing towards, and that is there were two historians who said that uh, Van Gogh, that uh, who suggested that uh, the ear was severed in, in essentially a sword fight. And the fact is Gauguin was a, a fencer, but it was in, in the middle of the night, in the dark, in a street, with a fencing foil, not with a sword, but with a fencing foil, that Van Gogh, that Gauguin could have sliced off Vincent's ear, seems, or that he would have, <laughs> seems really ridiculous. So yeah, I guess I just use the word ridiculous. I don't think there's any any merit to that claim at all. One thing we see in the movie after he cuts off his ear, Vincent goes to the asylum, San Remy, and that's on the advice of somebody named Dr. Felix Ray. The movie doesn't really give any sense of a timeline, but it doesn't seem to be very long before we see him leaving the asylum. And then while he's on the road to Arles, he comes, there's a woman uh, tending a flock of sheep. He asks her to pose for him, to draw. She agrees, but he kind of moves her around. She doesn't pose the way she likes. And then she struggles against him, says she doesn't want him touching her. So then we find that the people of Arles have a petition signed against him returning. It seems kind of vague about how all of that has happened. Can you fill in some details from history on that? The timeline there is completely jumbled, meaning that in the film, it suggests that Theo comes down to visit Van Gogh, or Van Gogh Vincent, before the ear incident. It also indicates that the ear incident happens after he's in, the, in, in at least some asylum, some mental institution, when in fact, of course, it was the ear incident that sent him into the into the, at first an asylum in Arles, and then eventually the asylum in Saint Remy. He was in Saint Remy for about, if I remember correctly, about nine months. And he does go back to Arles. He gets his request for a leave of absence is granted to go back in his, in Vincent's mind, to see Madame Ginou, who's a character in the film. Uh, but she never saw him, and he he was appears to have been either inebriated or in some sort of psychological distress. And he took her a gift of a painting and he lost the painting and he ended back uh, ended up back in the institution. So the timeline there and the activities that you just described are jumbled in the film. Again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. A, a screenwriter has the right to change the ordering of things. How do you address Madame Ginou? That was something that did seem... First of all, the girl on the on the way that he asked to pose for him, we don't know of that incident. But there were times, especially earlier in his painting career, where Van Gogh tried to get villagers to pose for him. He usually had to pay them because he was considered this crazy man. Literally, that was the word they used. And so they didn't want to have much to do with him. And, he, and I think Schnabel got from our book the fact that he poked and prodded these people in ways that was uncomfortable. So the I, the incident with this girl on the road didn't happen. At least we don't know that it happened. But the circumstances of it are not entirely unrealistic. Much more re- unrealistic, as we know the details, are the association with Mag- Madame Ginou back in Arles, where she offers to, uh, first of all, she seems very nice. Uh, again, she may have been nice to a lot of people, but she was. She found Vincent off-putting and Stiff armed him at every opportunity. So the place where he, where she offer asks him to paint her, and then he sort of shows disinterest, seems to be the exact opposite of the situation. Meaning he wanted desperately to paint her, and she had no interest in doing it. And in fact, it was only when Gauguin comes to Arles, and he the, the movie does does show this somewhat. Only after Gauguin's there, and and allows. Gauguin to paint her. Vincent, in the film, he comes into the room and starts painting her too. In reality, the two of them were sitting there. Madame Ginou is looking at, at, at Gauguin. 
She's not looking at Vincent. And Gauguin, because he worked much more slowly, did a drawing, which Vincent then used as the basis for five paintings. So it was an important incident, but the, the movie doesn't quite indicate the extent to which she knew, and like most other people, found Gauguin somebody they could interact with comfortably and didn't find Vincent somebody they could interact with comfortably. That's that's interesting. Yeah, they, they show that that Vincent paints a lot faster <laughs> than Gauguin. He did two paintings of her seated, seated at the table in the film. One of them is in the Orsay in, in, in Paris, and the better of the two is at the Metropolitan in New York. And Van Gogh, whichever came first, I think it was the one that's in the Metropolitan, he painted in something like 45 minutes. And he was quite proud of the fact that he worked that quickly. And just imagine this masterpiece of the Met. <laughs> one of the most popular paintings in that institution was dashed off in 45 minutes by our genius here. <laughs> that, yeah, <laughs> really puts it in perspective for sure. <laughs> oh, if we go back to the movie, the way it shows it, since he's not welcome in Arles anymore and not wanting to stay in a big city like Paris, Theo then sets up for his brother to stay at an inn at uh, Ouvert sur Oise. And that's where a Dr. Paul Cachet can help him. And so that's when we see in the movie, the next shot is, is Vincent painting Dr. Gachet's. Was that really how Vincent ended up there and meeting Gachet? Yes. What happened is that um, Gachet was a weird guy. <laughs> in fact, it, it, there's a wonderful sentence from Vincent, one of his letters to Theo saying, uh, saying, I think he's as crazy as I am. And he was not far off. He was a, a homeopath. He wasn't really a, um, a medical doctor as we think of it. But he was himself an artist of sorts and was a printmaker. And in fact, you can go to his house. So anybody listening to this should go to Auberge because it's really very touching. You can see his grave where he's buried next to Theo. You can see the room at the end where he died. You can see the wheat fields. You can see the church he painted. You can see the town hall he painted. And you can go to Gachet's house, which is also open to the public. And you can see the table where, he, where the painting was made. And you can go upstairs in the house and see the, pr the, uh, the printing press where Van Gogh made an etching of Gachet under Gachet's tutelage. Um, Gachet, uh, being an artist, had a, a whole following of artists. I can't remember the full list, but I think uh, Manet had seen him, and I think uh, Pizarro had seen him. And there, there were a number of artists living in, you know, there. Piz uh, Cezanne had lived there. Pizarro visited. Daubigny had a sequence of houses there. And Corot and Daumier visited Daubigny there. So it was an artist community. Jules Dupre, the Barbizon painter, lived in a town that was only a couple of miles away. So when uh, uh, Theo actually, this is more detailed than the movie was able to get into, Theo went to Pizarro, who was desperate for money. The, the, Pizarro, the great impressionist, and uh, whose wife was a bit of a shrew and was constantly screaming at him for not making any money. And there's a terrible, terrible incident in, in Pizarro's letters where he goes to Paris in the in the uh, middle of winter and to borrow a few francs and he couldn't get anybody to loan him any money. And that's given those financial circumstances, Theo asked Pizarro to take Vincent in. And Mrs. Pizarro, who was tough and sensible, said, I'm, no, I don't care how poor we are. <laughs> We're not dealing with that crazy guy. <laughs> so Pizarro came up with the idea of having him go to Aubert, where, where Gachet could watch over Vincent. But as I said earlier, Vincent was so cr difficult to be around, this co combination of viscosity and argumentativeness, that they had began to fight almost immediately. And so this, what Theo hoped for, which was that Gachet would watch over Vincent, ended almost immediately. But Vincent was only there for 70 days, so he wasn't there for a very long time because he died after a little over two months. You alluded to that earlier, and uh, near the end of the movie, we see Vincent with a gunshot wound in his stomach. We do see some flashbacks and voiceover. Vincent says that he was dressed like Buffalo Bills. We see two boys. One of them is a pistol coming up to Vincent. Uh, but the movie also doesn't really, kind of like with the, with the ear uh, incidents, it, we don't see anything actually happening. You know, We see the boys there. We see, hear the sound of a gunshot. But then later on, uh, we see Dr. Gachet asking Vincent if he shot himself, and he says, maybe, I don't remember, don't blame anyone. And then you know, Theo comes, but at that point, there's nothing to be done. 
So, in your opinion, does the movie accurately reflect how you think Vincent Van Gogh died? I've never met Schnabel, so uh, I can't ask this, but I do know that Willem Dafoe read our book, and there's no way that Schnabel didn't. I'd be stunned that he didn't. And I think he took that whole account from our book, which is flattering, and I'm delighted that he did. In fact, there's, the, the movie Loving Vincent, which is all about the death, is also pretty clearly based. In fact, the, right, the makers of that film contacted us before they made that film about accessing the book, and uh, Greg died soon thereafter, so nothing came of that. But Greg died before he could see the, the Schnabel film. I've now seen it twice. I think it's an extremely accurate account of the end. I'll give you the three-minute version, which is that uh, there were too many unclear things about Vincent dying. You know, the, the, why would he go out and paint the day that he was going to kill himself? What happened to the easel and to the paints, which in the movie, Schnabel has them burying them in the farmyard. These two boys clearly got rid of the easel uh, and the paints, but somebody had to do it because otherwise they would have been found. Also, the, the indications from within the community were that the gunshots took place in a farmyard along the river and not way up on the, uh, uh, in the wheat fields above the town, uh, which was part of the original assumption about how he died. And it never seemed real that with a bullet hole, hole in his belly that he could walk that far down the escarpment to get back to the inn. It would have been much easier on level ground to walk from the farmyard to the inn. Also, you know, if what happened to the gun? Where would Vincent have gotten the gun? They were very rare in in rural France, at the, or even in France generally at the time. Where did he get the gun? And as we're sort of asking those questions, which and we were not the first people to find this somewhat uncomfortable. The the, the, the facts didn't sort of add up. We found two things. One was an indication from from John Rewald, the great art historian who was in France studying the Sorbonne before World War II. He had to leave because he was Jewish and the Nazis were raging. But he was there early enough that he would go to Auvers. He was studying Cezanne in particular, and Cezanne had been there. Uh, he, would, he met all the villagers. Mind you, this was in the 1930s. Vincent died in 1890. So there were lots of people in Auvers who had been alive when Vincent was there and when Vincent died. And Rewald told everybody that he met that the villagers of Auvers said, that Vincent didn't shoot himself, that he was killed by two bullies. So we have that in our minds. And then there's an interview with a guy named uh, René Secretin, uh, made in 1957, I believe it was, 56 or 57, in which he's asked about this crazy painter that he and his brother Gaston knew when they were boys, teenagers, living in Auvers, where their father or other rich Parisians summered. And he admits that the gun was their gun uh, and that he and his brother tortured Vincent. They put hot pepper on his paintbrushes because he used to chew his paintbrushes. They put salt in his coffee. They would take him to cafes and get him drunk. They tried to, to uh, they put a, a snake in his, in his paint box. And interestingly, and this is where it comes from in the movie, that summer, th there had been a big fair, uh, the big fair in Paris that it just happened, the biggest draw was Buffalo Bill. And they sold Buffalo Bill costumes. And Rene, who was, I think, 15 at the time, had one of these costumes. Another person who bought the costume at that fair, this is very amusing, was Paul Gauguin. And when Paul Gauguin comes off the boat in Tahiti years later, he's wearing his Buffalo Bill costume. Just imagine that image for a moment. Anyway, and he, so he, they, they, he doesn't, it, they, were, they were quite successful. Gaston became a, a singer and cabaret artist, but René became one of the great sharpshooters in France and uh, was a banker and quite wealthy. And he doesn't admit to shooting Vincent. It would, it would have been, he wasn't going to commit, uh, 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 but it would seem to Greg and me very unlikely he would admit, admit in an article that he had committed a murder in a way that would still be a, could still have been prosecuted at that point, but you have the rumors in the town that these two boys that two boys had shot him. Then you find out that um, they knew Vincent and knew him pretty well, and that it was their gun, and that they were torturing him. So what? Um, and it would explain the comment at the at the end that you mentioned earlier, which is when asked by Gachet 
or I think it was a policeman who actually asked the question, did you shoot yourself? And he says, uh, uh, I think so. Uh, don't blame anybody else, which is a very weird thing to, to, to say. Uh, I should tell you that really this is not an art historical question. It's a forensic question. It's for uh, criminal experts. And we showed the, the material to quite a few forensic experts, including the leading American forensic expert on the issue of handguns used to either for suicide or for murder, his name was DeMeo, would go into crime scenes and it specifically where there was some confusion as to whether a handgun had been used by the victim uh, to kill himself or whether it had been used by someone else in, in what was essentially a murder. And he looked at the material and said there was no question that Vincent had not shot himself, having to do with, first of all, the way he could have had it. It would have been very hard to hold his gun and to shoot himself in the in the in the stomach. Uh, it was just it would require a, a kind of gymnastics with the gun that would have been very unlikely. The, DeMeo mentioned that there there the first thing that the doctors would have noticed about the entry wound, and Gachet did inspect the wound, would have been that uh, if Vince, Vincent had shot himself, that the whole area around the wound would have been singed because it would have uh, it would have burned him because they didn't have smokeless powder at the time. And if he'd been shot at that proximity, at that close to, the, to himself, it, it would have singed the, the whole area around the wound. And it would have been the first thing the doctors would have mentioned in their description of the wound. And there was no such mention. So because the suicide is such a big part of the story, as related by Irving Stone, both in his novel in the 1930s and then in the film with uh, Kirk Douglas in 1956, Lust for Life. It, and because it's been in the meat, it's been in, in books ever since then, you know, the phrase when Vincent shot himself has been written and published so many times. It's been, there are people who said what we wrote was uh, pretty clear, but there have been a lot of people, especially in the field, who don't want to give up the, under, the accepted version of the death. So it was um, gratifying to see Schnabel accept our version of the death so completely and uh, to film it so nicely in, in the movie we're talking about. So is it mostly that because Vincent had said not to blame anybody else for it and that he was, I think, he said, I think so, was that, is that mostly why the police didn't investigate further? Yes, and the, pe and the people around Vincent didn't, assumed he'd done it. I mean, he didn't, he didn't describe, either Theo didn't press him for the details when he finally got there, or Vincent just in line with not wanting to blame anyone. No, no one really questioned it. You know, they, first of all, he was dying. He was in great agony. He was in great pain. People were running around trying to get Theo there early enough to be there with Vincent before he died, which he, and he had to get on a train and they had to get word. There weren't telephones. He had to get their word back to Paris. Theo had to get on the train. He had to come to, to and by the time he got there, Vincent was in terrible shape. You know, they could barely exchange a few words. And so they accepted this idea that he had done it himself and didn't press it. And then only a couple of people thought this, but the word started spreading from one person to another. So a lot of the people who believe that Vincent shot himself will say, well, so-and-so thought he shot himself, and this other person thought he shot himself, and they'll give a list of seven or eight people. Well, they all heard it from the same person. You know, so it really was only one source, and that person didn't press Vincent on it. One, one of Greg's and my feeling, and I think the, maybe the movie suggests this, is you know, people liked the crown of thorns aspect of him killing himself at the end, meaning it was a, sort of a part of this romantic arc to Vincent's life that he finally couldn't take it anymore, and he shot himself. Greg and I always thought, first of all, one of the great noble aspects of Vincent's life is that he persisted in the face of all this misery. You know, the, the bravery of just of not only pushing on, but of creating this vast body of extraordinary work, one of the great groups of paintings ever done, is certainly in that kind of time frame. In the, in the face of all that misery is really, that that's much nobler than the sort of romantic story of him, of a crazy artist killing himself at the end. And 
it was part of Vincent's, one of his um, other most attractive qualities was this sort of generosity of spirit. We, we talked earlier about Vincent leaving Paris after two years. It was an enormous act of self-sacrifice to leave. And he left mostly because he understood that Theo, who was in as much, who was ill too, was being damn. He could see that his brother was being damaged by living with him and being so difficult. So the re, there are many people, people have tried to figure out why did Vincent finally, he spent his whole adult life wanting to live with Theo. He finally gets to Paris, lives with Theo. Then he just gets up and leaves town. And Greg and I believe that the principal reason, and there are indications in the letters that s- support this, that he left because he knew that being there any longer would make, would, and, and Theo did die six months after Vincent did, at an even younger age, in an insane asylum. So Theo was ill, but it still was an act of self-sacrifice to take off and leave. And that's of a piece with not wanting these two boys who were teenagers to have their lives ruined, especially if they didn't murder him. And Greg and I don't think, and I don't think the movie suggests that there was an out-and-out murder. I mean, basically, Rene was wearing this Buffalo Bill costume. They had borrowed the gun from the innkeeper. That's where they got the gun. And it didn't really work terribly well. And they were playing cowboy and Indian all summer. And so they got into a scuffle. Uh, this is the likely explanation. They got into a scuffle with Vincent. The gun went off and Vincent dies. And in the clarity of his last hours, it, it seems an act, an incredibly noble act to decide this has already happened. You know, in some ways it's, he may have even welcomed it on a certain level. You know, now I don't have to be miserable any longer. And why ruin these two boys' lives unnecessarily? It's not going to get. It's not going to bring me back to help. That would be a, an even nobler and and more wonderful end to Vincent's life than this sort of luster life histrionics. Yeah, and it would make sense based on what you were talking about earlier. If you know, um, if he was difficult to be around, and everybody that was around him knew about his mental instabilities that they would just believe that oh he decided to to kill himself and they wouldn't really question it everybody in town knew that he'd been in an insane asylum and because of the ear incident you know, his ear was missing you know he was, he was so people knew that he and, and also as i said earlier you know his behavior was odd you know he was he was intense and way beyond uh he almost people would describe him almost shaking with intensity, and so everybody knew he was crazy. So this crazy, and they called him uh, for some of the, and, and he was constantly he was constantly being mistreated by young young boys, uh, some of whom in French called him the fou the fou roux, which is French for crazy redhead. You know, so the, the he was actually called crazy by the townspeople who wanted nothing to do with him. So the fact that he died of a gunshot wound. Yeah, it seemed uh, uh, in the absence of another explanation. But interestingly, over time, the town came to the opinion through whatever information. We don't know how the opinion developed, but by the, by the 1930s, it was pretty well assumed that he had not shot himself, as I said earlier. That, the, that two bullies, at, at, in the rumors, unnamed, but it had to be the two secretan boys since it was their gun and they were the right age and they knew him. And Greg, this is quite wonderful. Greg found a drawing of Rene in the Buffalo Bill costume by Van Gogh in the um, that's in the collection of the Lou- of the uh, Louvre. So we, you know, there's a, there's there's actually a drawing of uh, of Rene by Vincent. It's 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 dashed off, but it's charming. It's it's in our it's in the biography, so you can you can see the uh, the drawing. As the movie comes to a close, we see Vincent's body surrounded by his paintings in Theo's gallery. And- People start coming in, and I got the impression that it wasn't long after Vincent's death that his paintings finally started to sell. How long did it actually take before people started to appreciate his work? This is one of the sort of sadnesses, and it also runs counter to the murder theory. He he was becoming famous even before he died, meaning that in January, he died in July. In January, there was a big article by a, a, a man who became quite famous named Aurier about Vincent, in which he calls him the greatest living painter in a uh, journal in Paris. And it was a very long article. It's, it's hard to read. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very much of its period. 
but he unmistakably says Vincent is the most interesting painter out there. So people were reading this, and then Theo contributed several of Vincent's paintings to a group show, and a lot of people were taking notice. And then, just before he died, his paintings were, sh were shown at a very important exhibition of contemporary art in Brussels. And among the artists who noticed them and said, this is, this is something very interesting is happening here, were Claude Monet and the Belgian pointillist, a very important painter named uh, Theo van Rijsselberg, and Toulouse Lautrec, who had known Vincent very slightly in Paris, also began to look at the paintings at that moment and admired them enormously. So even before Vincent dies, people as important as Toulouse Lautrec and Monet are beginning to see that this these are not the ravings of an insane person. These are very important paintings. And then uh, shortly after his death, in fact, this uh, the new book that uh, that's coming out in November has a wonderful afterword by Anne Dumas of the uh, Royal Academy in London, in which he traces what we're now talking about, which is his quick rise to fame after he died. And the heroine of the story was Theo's uh, widow. When Theo dies, his widow, Joanna Bonger, translated all Van Gogh's letters into English, and she managed the sales of his work and the loans of his works to uh, exhibitions that very cleverly and astutely and brilliantly even managed his quick rise to fame after he died. I mean, that would make perfect sense then why, I mean, if he's finally starting to get some of this acclaim even before he died, then yeah, why would he, why would he kill himself at that point? Why would he kill himself? If people were already, that, it was complicated. He, when, when Aurier called him the world's greatest painter, you know, he didn't really know how to even assimilate that. <laughs> you know, he's just, he's in an insane asylum in the south of France and nobody's bothering to visit him. And he's reading this thing and thinking, me and but he was also very proud of it and he started writing letters to everybody he knew saying you might want to take a look at Aurier's article it talked about me a little and uh, and he was terribly proud that people like Monet were looking at his work and taking it seriously you know it was it was in some ways the best moment in his life you're quite right one of the reasons why it was so why why kill himself now and also the other I've talked to psychiatrists about this he talked about suicide with some frequency throughout his life, but he never, you know, he never did it. And, you know, the people who actually do kill themselves aren't the ones who talk about it a lot. They're the people who go out and do it. And uh, the, I don't want to distort the, the, the trajectory of our conversation, but the, like two days before the incident where he died, or the, the, two days before the gunshot wound, he sent Theo a long list of materials that he needed, paints and canvases. So he was not in, in an end stage Cycle a lot. He was not. Uh, he was not thinking about death in those last few days. He was thinking about, and he was also incredibly productive. He was making a painting every single day. You know, you're not terribly depressed if you're getting up every morning. And many of those paintings are masterpieces. I mean, the world's greatest museums are filled with the paintings he made in his last seventy days. So it was not a period of depression. It was a period of understanding that he was beginning to be seen and understood. And therefore, sales might happen. And Theo and his wife and child are only living 30-minute train ride away. He's no longer in an insane asylum. You know, life was difficult, but it was actually pretty good there at the end. And God knows all of us are the beneficiaries because we, you know, we see these paintings like uh, the, uh, I could go through the list, but a lot of the most famous paintings were done there at the end. But one of the, sad, the saddest things about him dying at this young age is that he was moving towards abstraction. There's a, a landscape at the National Gallery in Washington from this period that's all green and white and yellow and just a swirling brush strokes. And I mean, you can see that it's a landscape, but it's, it, it's moving in the direction of complete abstraction. And some of the drawings he did at the, at, at, in Auvergne, because in addition to the 70 paintings, he did a lot of drawings, are stunningly abstract. So, you know, given that he only painted for 10 years, that almost all the paintings we know well were done in the last four years, and that all most of the major masterpieces were done in the last two years. Imagine if he painted two more years, or five more years, or ten more years. What would they? What would the paintings have looked like? I think the, they would have been even more audacious than they were, and the quantity would have been overwhelming. 
If he could paint all those paintings that we know in two years, imagine what he would have been able to do in 10 more years. So there's there's plenty of sadness in, in having his life cut short that way. It sounds like it, it, that increased productivity is also another clue that he didn't kill himself because like you were saying, he never uh, painted when he was in one of those states. And so <laughs> exactly. He was not good point. One of the points we actually make in, 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 in the biography is if he had shot himself, it probably would like the ear incident, like cutting off his ear, it probably would have happened in a psychotic episode. He was out painting. He had his easel in his paints and he was doing, he was working. He was not in the psychotic episode. Well, there is a, a bit of text at the very end of the movie that ties into something we see earlier in the movie. Uh, it happens when Vincent asks Dr. Ray to return some items to Madame and Monsieur Junot, uh, along with a book of his drawings as a gift. And in this, uh, we see this ledger. And then at the very end, uh, th- that there's some text that says there were 65 drawings inside and they weren't discovered until 126 years later in 2016. Is that true? Well, this is a place where lawyers might get involved. So let me, let me be really careful what I say here. A notebook, a ledger did emerge in the last five or seven years. And I don't know how, uh, I think it is uh, accepted that Madame Genou gave him a blank ledger to work on. Uh, let me just say that the, um, that the drawings in that ledger are not entirely accepted by all the, um, the authorities on Van Gogh. And I invite anybody who knows Van Gogh at all to take a look at those drawings and decide for themselves whether they think Vincent uh, made those drawings. I, I could, I, when I saw that, I was like, I could only imagine that discovery. <laughs> if, you know, if, if it was real, you know, what, what sort of discovery that would be to, to find anything like that. Oh, it, it, believe me, it got a lot of attention and although not as much attention as I think it would have gotten if there had been a uh, consensus about the authenticity of, of Van Gogh as the person who created those drawings. So I'm not sure whether they're real or not. Well, since, since a lot of people use movies as a way of understanding history, I want to ask you, what's something about Van Gogh that most people wouldn't know if they just watched this movie and, and stopped there and they didn't dig any deeper? I think the visual sophistication and the and the intellectual sophistication, the artistic sophistication of Van Gogh, because the paintings are so raw, you know, the color is so bright, and it was seen as a lot brighter back then. You know, we've seen Warhol and Jeff Koons in the interim, not to mention industrial, you know, commercial advertising. Those the, the, the that intense palette seemed shockingly intense to the people back in 1888, 1890. And the brushwork is so immediate and, and is done with such vigor that people, I think people who, who haven't read the letters and who don't know him intensely as, uh, as, a, as a person, as a thinker, will be shocked to understand what, a, what an intellect, intellectual he was and what a uh, knowledgeable person he was. In, the, in this new book that uh, is coming out in November, not only do I pair paintings by Van Gogh with paintings by other people, many of which he knew, and you, and, and you see the complex artistic associations between their work and his, and uh, without even having to read anything, you can see his mind working through what the artist before him had done in a very sophisticated artistic way. But the other thing that, uh, that, that I was able to do in the book is to have quotes from Vincent about those paintings or uh, about those artists. And my God, if you haven't read the letters, I mean, he would have been important even if he had never painted anything because the letters are so brilliant and so da- erudite and so dazzling. And his, not only did he have this encyclopedia, this photographic memory for art, he had a photographic memory for, for poetry and for, for l- literature. He could remember wide swaths of German romantic poetry for once he'd read it. Uh, he could read in, not only in Dutch and in French, but in English and German. And he spent about five hours of every day reading. He would find an author and like what they had written and read everything they wrote 
Then he would read it again later in life. So he read Shakespeare, all of it, multiple times. The French naturalist Zola and um, Balzac, he read over and over and over again. In things you wouldn't expect, he loved Dickens. He also loved Harriet Beecher Stowe. One of his favorite novels was Uncle Tom's Cabin, which he read every Christmas. So one of the things that's so exciting about Van Gogh is that he's loved by everybody. He's loved by everybody in every country. He's loved by everybody of every age range. You know, five-year-olds love him, 90-year-olds love him. You know, people who rarely ever go into a museum, think of the millions of people going to these immersive uh, exhibitions who may or may not ever have gone to an art museum to actually see the real paintings. He's loved by people who may never see one in the flesh, and he's loved by, I have never met an art historian who did not like Van Gogh's work. The consensus is complete. I mean, there is not a, an art historian, I uh, could be wrong, but I don't, I've never met an art historian who didn't admire, he didn't just enjoy Van Gogh's work, but admired it as one of the great creative enterprises in the in t- entire history of art. One of the reasons is that Ron, that, that sort of authenticity, which helps explain why he's so appealing to people who you know, might not like other great artists, and by every you know, museum curator and art historian who spends their whole life looking at art, is that in addition to the authenticity is this unbelievable sophistication. So to your question, that's the one thing that I think not everybody might know about Vincent. Since since he was so into literature and, and poetry, and obviously he wrote a lot to Theo in, in letters, did he ever try to get into literature or, or poetry or, or write anything like that? No, and in fact, one of the things that Greg, uh, my co-author and, and life partner, discerned, in, in Greg spent three years reading those letters, like a Talmudic scholar reading the Bible. I mean, he, he read them incredibly intensely and carefully. And one of the points that Greg made was, you have to understand these were not written for posterity. He had no idea that anybody would ever read these letters. He wrote them for Theo. So they're very manipulative. <laughs> you know, they're, they're constantly asking. We talked earlier about the fact that Theo was supporting him. Well, Vincent was always coming up with reasons why Theo should at least advance him some money or should increase the amount of money he was giving him. There are these long arguments that can sometimes cover several pages in a row why basically the, the message be, uh, being give me more money. And, and often Vincent did draft these things and would rework them before he did the final draft that went off to Theo. Now, not all the letters are asking for money. So he, because he was so lonely and because he had such an agile mind, he desperately wanted to share his thinking with somebody. And that somebody was Theo in these letters. So if he's reading something, he wants to share with Theo his excitement at some new passage in Shakespeare or some passage in, in some French novelist uh, or some bit of poetry or something about his own paintings, the, the, so some of the thinking that's going into what he's working on at the moment, or something about a painting by an artist who inspired him. It was all done in the intimacy of this complicated relationship with Theo uh, he never, to answer your question, uh, never imagined writing for outside the framework of his correspondence with his brother. It's a uh, another thing that kind of a shame that he passed away so young. Because I mean, it, if he, maybe if he got more popular and more famous, maybe he would have. I mean, there's some passages. It's one thing in the in the, in the new book about the artist he, Vincent and Van Gogh and the artist he loved is. Uh, is a passage about, he wrote about religion a lot and thought about religion because he wanted to be a pastor. His original intent in life was to be a a pastor like his father. In fact, he went to study religion and then he pulled away from religion and became essentially an atheist by the the time he died. But he never stopped thinking about religion and wrote about it beautifully. And there, there are a couple of paragraphs about God and about our place in the universe that are not just beautiful, but are philosophical on a very deep level. It was a beautiful mind. It was a seriously beautiful mind that behind the, these very beautiful paintings. You mentioned it there, a great segue into your brand new book that uh, just published today, that book called Van Gogh and the Artists He Loved. Can you give someone listening an overview of your new book and where they can get a copy? 
Sure. Uh, well, it's available from you know Amazon and all the other uh, likely places and independent bookstores and museums. But uh, you know, in a biography, and Greg, and, you know, I spent ten years writing with Van Gogh, The Life. You can't really illustrate the paintings very well. I mean, there the, the there are some black color illustrations in there, but most of them are black and white, and they're very small. We always uh, were frustrated that we couldn't show Vincent's paintings as well as they need to be shown, and the book, the biography was about the life. If you just change the the aperture slightly, instead of seeing the art in the context of the life, you can see the uh, you can see the art directly and have the life simply help you understand the art. And um, so the book, the, there are over three hundred illustrations, most of them full page. The entire book is in color. And God bless Random House, they produce this four hundred and forty eight page book. And it's less than $34 on Amazon. It's, it's this great big juicy book, if I may say so, but mostly because Random House did a brilliant job of producing it. And they, because they printed enough copies, it's, um, it's available for this remarkably small uh, amount of money. So you have this opportunity to see these beautiful paintings with the paintings of the artist that he admired. For example, we mentioned earlier in the show that when they were with Madame Genou and, and the Yellow House pictured in the in the film, Gauguin's doing the drawing, and then Van Gogh made based because he left the drawing with Vincent. Van Gogh made five paintings based on that drawing. He lost the one on the way taking it to Madame Genou, but all four of the others are there are shown in the book next to the drawing by Gauguin. You can see these wonderful associations and and the variety. The, the, the four that are left by the four paintings, oil paintings by Vincent, you can see how he played with the, the palette from one to the other in these marvelous, uh, marvelous ways. Then you can see, uh, you know, subjects that an earlier artist had, had, uh, had treated. For instance, a wonderful field of poppies by Vincent in a European collection. Actually, it's in The Hague. And uh, Monet had done the same scene. And you see how Ma Monet handles it. Then you see what Van Gogh does with it. And they're both marvelous in their different ways. Some of the olive groves, you know, Van Gogh did several different series of olive groves. Well, the, Monet did the series before Van Gogh did. And it's hard to imagine Vincent didn't know Monet's paintings because the Monet's are magnificent. The Van Gogh's are just sublime. Uh, and I could go through example after example. He also, Vincent, is, as, as I say in the book, it is hard to imagine another artist who continued to make copies of other artists' work as far into their careers as Vincent did. He, he did it early on, as many artists do, to sort of learn cra the craft and to, and to assimilate the ideas of other artists. But Vincent continued to make copies right up to the end. He, and made copies of, for example, and some people may not know this, uh, he collected, in addition to uh, black and white wood engravings, he collected Japanese prints. He owned about a thousand Japanese prints. He loved them. And three of his paintings were essentially, they, they, they weren't exact copies. He would take a, he would take the Japanese print and do a, a, which tended to be quite small and make it a large painting and make the colors much brighter and, and manipulate the images in, in various ways to make them his own. So, and, and uh, me, the, the artist he probably loved the, the, the most was Jean-Francois Millet, the peasant painter. And dozens of times he took a small black and white image by Millet, for instance, the print Millet did of the sower. And then he would do these big colorful paintings based on Millet's image. So I think it's a wonderful opportunity, not only to see Van Gogh's art, but to see it in the context of the art that, uh, that inspired it. And I think you, you don't have to be an art historian to be excited by the process, you know, the, 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 the excitement that Van Gogh felt in looking at this art, loving it so much and making something at least as exciting and very new out of the earlier art. And that's what I think the new book accomplishes. At least I hope it does. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Dan. It's a real pleasure. Thank you so much. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. And me, Mackenzie Davis. I'd like to thank Stephen Nafee for taking the time to help us separate fact from fiction in 2018's At Eternity's Gate. Don't forget to pick up a copy of Stephen's brand new, beautiful book called 
Van Gogh, and the artists he loved. You can find a link to that in the show notes for this episode. And of course, if you're driving or unable to check out the show notes right now, you can always find the link at any time on the show's home on the web based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Paul Gauguin was interested in Vincent van Gogh because of his art dealer brother. Number two, John Rewald said the villagers in Auvergne told him Van Gogh was killed by two bullies. Number three, Vincent's brother Theo went on to sell Vincent's artwork for years after his brother's death. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number one. Paul Gauguin was interested in Vincent Van Gogh because of his art dealer brother. That is true. As Stephen explained, Theo Van Gogh was one of the few art dealers in Paris at the time who was show, showing the most recent avant-garde work. So Gauguin's initial interest in hanging out with Vincent was essentially to get access to Theo. That brings us to number two. John Rewald said the villagers in Auvergne told him that Van Gogh was killed by two bullies. That is also true. Stephen told us that in the 1930s, John Rewald was in Auvergne studying the artist Cezanne, and the villagers there knew Vincent Van Gogh and told him that Van Gogh was killed by two bullies. That means the lie is number three. Vincent's brother Theo went on to sell Vincent's artwork for years after his brother's death. In truth, Theo Van Gogh died just six months after his brother Vincent. While Vincent's work was starting to gain popularity near the end of his life, after both brothers died, it was Theo's wife who was translated all of Van Gogh's letters into English, as well as managed the sales and loans of his work to help Vincent Van Gogh's quick rise to fame after his death. That just about wraps up our time together today. Before we go, the last thing I like to do on each episode is to share how much time and effort went into creating this episode. My hope in sharing this information is to really go beyond just my podcast, but hopefully it'll give you appreciation for all the podcasts that you listen to for free just a little bit more. Of course, I only have these stats for my own show. So with that said, today's episode took a total of 31 hours to create. And as I always do, I want to make it clear that's only my time for this one episode. In other words, that 31 hours does not include any of my guest time researching the subject matter we talk about. It also does not include the time that it takes for me to do podcast related things that are not a part of creating this one episode. For example, the time it takes to maintain the Based on a True Story website, social media, the email newsletter, and all those other little things that are outside creating a single podcast episode that are still required to create the show overall. All those things take time to set up and maintain and cost money that goes beyond the things that are associated with this one episode, but they're all things that are required because if I didn't do those things, there would not be any episodes of based on a true story at all. In a nutshell, this podcast may be free to listen to, but it is not free to create, and that's why I am so thankful for the sponsors whose ads you've heard on this episode. You can find out more information about them over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash advertisers. But they're not the only ones helping to keep the show alive. There are wonderful people just like you who are helping to keep this show financially going. So if you found value in today's episode, I hope you'll consider helping to support the next episode over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.